Let me just take this opportunity to greet you all in the powerful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. This is my second time, if not the third time, that I'm in this beautiful church, Forest Town Methodist Church. And I am honored uh, to be here this evening. And thank you, James, for trusting me to come and uh, be part of the conversation of your Lenten journey. Just to say, I must confess that um, when you called me, I, um, I just agreed. And I didn't know what I was agreeing. <laughs> so, <laughs> maybe, I don't know. I wasn't thinking. But after some time, I thought, my goodness, it's the middle of Lent, and I'm supposed to do this. And, but you know what? I'm glad uh, for you having to push me. Um, to the margins and make sure that I move out of my comfort zone and to come and share my faith journey. Just a little bit of background uh, about me. Moachi uh, Sukhejani. I am originally from a very small town in the northwest, Orkney, in the Clarkstop. I am a last born of the six siblings. Uh, I am from a family where my father uh, worked at a hardware store and my mom was a primary school teacher and um, she passed away when i was doing standard two i don't know what grade is that standard two and 20 years later my father died Three years after my mother died, my father remarried, and I was actually uh, brought up by my elder sisters and brothers. So I have never in any moment felt the presence of my mother or my father. So I had a good life. <laughs> and I always joke about it, when people say to me, ah, shame, when did she pass away? Ah, you were nine years old. Ah, shame, no. I said, ah, you know what? These parents are like this. They run away from their responsibilities. And look at me now. Um, God gave me a great parent, the Jesus whom we all follow and worship. And here I am. Nobody can now tell that I didn't even have my mother and my father during my years of being a teenager. Just to say that I, after matric, I went to um, Val Triangle Technicon, pursued a career in human resource management. And first year at Val Triangle Technicon, then moved to Johannesburg at Val Triangle, uh, not Val Triangle, that's Technicon, Auckland Park campus. And when I was supposed to complete my diploma, I answered a call to the ordained ministry of the Methodist Church of Southern Africa. And you can imagine what my brothers and sisters' uh, reaction was. Are you mad? There's no money there. How are you going to live? Can you really waste our money like this and go into this thing that you don't even know what it entails? But God has been the pillar of my life and I pushed boundaries and I pursued this ordained ministry of the Methodist Church of Southern Africa. I started at Central Methodist Church I uh, underpulled the rain. I <clears throat> uh, stayed there for one year. I moved to Kilnatin John Wesley College, stayed there for one year. And then I was sent to Soweto. So now listen carefully. So this is what happened. I am Sotho, my home language. So I was then sent to uh, uh, Jabavu Seket in Soweto, where I was responsible for Three societies, one Africans, two Xhosa, 
three Zulu. <laughs> and I'm Zutu. I enjoyed those moments with those communities. But let me just share this, that when I sensed a call to ordained ministry, I was suffering from rheumatic disease. For two years, I was put on penicillin because my heart muscles were damaged and cardiologists were trying to rebuild my muscles. And they said to me, we'll put you on penicillin for two years. And um, after two years, if there's no sign of, of, of good health, we will have to operate you. Because part of your heart problem is you've got an abnormal, normal heart with a valve that is thicker than the normal valve. So I was supposed to take one tablet three times a day. So the, for the first six months, I followed what the doctors said I must do. But after six months, I would take two tablets in the morning and three during the day and maybe four in the, in the evening because I, it was overdose, but it didn't do anything with me. I mean, I was normal, look at me now. I'm, I'm the healthiest man ever lived. And after two years, I returned to the doctor who at the time moved to Johannesburg and they put me on short stay, uh, sent me to Paraguanath Hospital. When I arrived there, there were about six cardiologists waiting for me. And they, do te they did tests there, and um, I still remember the forms that this chief cardiologist uh, filled in. Um, they started with all these uh, vital signs and stuff, ECG, you name it. And <clears throat> Ultimately, they went to a corner, they discussed, and then they came back. So it was three on each side. And I'm thinking, they said to me, okay, fine, uh, you are underage, so we need somebody to sign a consent form. So we're waiting for some results to come, and then we will know as to whether we should operate you or not. Do you have anybody who can quickly come here and sign a consent form? There was nobody. I don't have relatives in Soweto, so I had to call my minister, who then called the minister in Soweto to act on my parents' behalf. So they did. They signed off the consent form. And then the test results came, and I still remember those forms were in pink color. I still remember this cardiologist uh, next to my head writing in each of the blocks, normal, normal, paging over normal, paging over normal, paging over normal. And he said to me, you stop your treatment now, you are now normal. But there's one thing, you've got an abnormal valve, you don't have to get worried because that's how you're going to live. We cannot operate on it. You've got an abnormal heart, so be it. So get up and leave. From that very moment, I then decided, you know what, I think I owe God my life and I went back to church and I said to God tell me what I need to do and the rest is history here I am being called bossed around by your minister now these are some of the challenges that I came across when I was sent to Soweto being a Susutu um, and I'll, I, I have divided 
the challenges in Soweto into two. Uh, I concentrate on the Zulu congregation and the Kosa congregation. So the Zulus, they only regard the Zulu men as the men in the house. At the time, I was single, childless, very young, very dynamic, not controlled by tradition and culture. So you can imagine, when you go into a black setup, there's a structured order of service. You should do this. When you get to this point, this is what you need to do. So I came from college, very dynamic, in a Zulu congregation. These are the things that I came across as challenges. Number one, I wasn't allowed, even though a minister in training, to deal with any marital concerns of anybody in the congregation because I was told, you are a child. We don't care about your calling into this ministry. You cannot deal with these things. So I had to constantly deal with elderly people in the church, Zulus, trying to say to me, you cannot deal with these things. How do you know? And how are you going to deal with marital problems? You are a child. Secondly, it was constantly said to me by these Zulu men, Umfanawam, meaning my child. So we'll be in church. You say, you can imagine, I'm in church, I am leading a meeting, I'm leading a service, and somebody stands up and addresses a minister in full robes. You can imagine, I am my child. You're not supposed to do that. Uh, this is our part. So sit down. So those are some of the challenges that I came across. What was my reaction? Can you guess? Can I? I'll only show you by my facial expression. <laughs> because as somebody who's called, you are molded by the values and principles of Christianity, of God, and the Bible. So you are obliged as a Christian to be patient with everybody. And so I had to learn the skill of trying to win these elderly men into understanding where I come from and where they are as members of the body of Christ that they should not bring in things of culture, things of tradition, into the things of God. I had to gradually, without causing any conflict or chaos, make these men understand that Jesus pushed boundaries. Jesus challenged powers that be. Jesus healed on the Sabbath. And so my point of view in dealing with these things was to take an attitude of Christ in dealing with those things. And the other thing, I was constantly reminded, oh boy, you must remember, we Zulus. With Zulus, your place here, you there, you are the child. So there was a prejudice of ageism playing here. So you young, we old. You cannot, as a minister in your age, say to me, sit down, you are out of order. So you can imagine an elderly person standing up, going all around in circles, and I'm standing there, or seated there, and I'm thinking, but I need to say this. And ultimately, I say, so this, this was my attitude. You see, I, I love the Lord's Prayer. You know, Jesus was no stupid. When he said to these uh, disciples of his, when you pray, you should say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come. You saw, you, 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 I mean, you entice God. You prepare God. And, and, and at that time when God is kind of like enjoying this, you kind of like say, give us today our daily bread. And so I said to these fathers, refer to them as, as I spoke to them, daddy or papa, this is how I see it. And then that will soften them. I don't know how, but they kind of like felt, you know, their status in the congregation was elevated. The relationship between me and them, I was like saying to them, I acknowledge that you are my father. But at this point in time, you are out of order. And so I was extremely diplomatic in addressing these fathers of mine. Let me just speak about the causes. Any causes in the room? Ah, okay. Oh, by the way, I'm married to a Zulu woman. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> Can I tell you about the Zulus? Can I tell you? No. Okay. Is there any Zulu in the room? No. Okay. When you marry a Zulu, apart from the Lobola, they will give you a list of people to buy blankets for. <laughs> and so, and then you don't just buy those blankets and then hand them over to those people. You throw a feast. So I had three weddings. The first traditional wedding at her mom's place, the white wedding, and the third traditional wedding at my father's place. The budget, I don't know what happened. So if any one of you, uh, a son or grandson or whoever wants to marry Ezul, don't go there. <laughs> don't. It's a no-go area. So let's talk about the, Zul, the, the courses. So with the courses, the church belongs to them. All because Methodism started in the Eastern Cape. And so they think that they own the Methodist Church of Southern Africa. One, there's no better preacher than a closer preacher. It doesn't matter you Africans or English or Sutu or Tswana. It doesn't matter as you preach heaven comes on earth. The fact remains, better preachers are closers. The other thing is that I'm Sutu. The other thing is that when we preach in township, there's always an interpreter. But as the spirit leads you, you kind of like leave your interpreter behind. <laughs> and what happens to the closest? They complain. And then they come back to you and they say horrible things about your preaching. How I dealt with it to soften them, I had to learn to read closer. You sing any other hymn other than Kosa, they don't sing. And so you are left in a space where you kind of like say to yourself, am I here to please a particular group or am I here to share the gospel? So after three years of being in that situation of Africans, Tosa, Zulu, I remember uh, going to Paul Verain's office and I said to him, hey Bishop, I beg of you, if you could please send me to um, a colored or a white congregation. I said, what? Are you wanting to become white? I said, no, you see, 
Uh, let me just tell you something. You see, when you, when you are in a township setup, your preaching style must change. You must use voice dynamics. You must actually make sure that you don't talk like I'm talking now. So I said to Paul, please, two months before I was told that I'm going to Willow Park Methodist Church, um, he said to me, uh, Moahi, let me just tell you uh, that we are from a connectional executive. It was on, in August. He says to me, uh, your name moved from Ivory Park Methodist Church to Randberg Methodist Church to Mondio Methodist Church um, to Discovery Methodist Church and ultimately it landed at Willow Park Methodist Church in one meeting. And I was told, please pack your bags and go. That year, I just ordained. So I was following a senior minister in terms of ordination experience and in terms of the number of serving in the Methodist Church and as a Dane minister. So I was following in the footsteps of your Gavin Taylor's, uh, Gavin Hancock, um, uh, uh, Sabas, and I came out of Soweto as a fresh minister just got ordained into Willow Park Methodist. So when I got there, the secretary resigned, the bookkeeper resigned, the pianist resigned, the worship team disappeared. The church was left with 39 members. So I then went to Branson Methodist Church. Chris Harrison gave me a CD to play some music. So I used my laptop to play the music. So there wasn't anybody to help with operating the laptop. So I'll operate the laptop and play the music, lead worship and everything else, preach and then go back. So it was that kind of a situation for three months. And somebody fought with another Mr. Somewhere and then she landed up in my church. I said, hallelujah. I don't care what happened between you and that minister. All that I want is to see somebody leading worship. And so I just want to share some of the um, victories, triumphs, challenges that I faced at, at, at Willow Park Methodist Church and some of the perceptions that I experienced uh, there. Number one, understand that I am from Clarkstop. I am Sutu. I have never had a chance of preaching in English more regularly, weekly so. Now thrown into the deep end of having to go to a white congregation with that background. And my understanding is that biblical English is not the same as ordinary English. You know the difference. You white, so you should know. I mean, I'm so too. You should know this, you know. And so, so my first sermon, Christmas, I preached, and um, <laughs> so I had to wait at the door. And you know, God bless you. Thank you for coming. So I was orientated into doing that. And and uh, some lady came and said. Were you actually saying working or walking? I thought, <laughs> no, I mean working. Okay, okay, my dear, next time you preach, you must please uh, make sure that your interpretation is clear. You must say walking and working. You see here, if you don't become clear, we lose you. And she says to me, we didn't hear any of your message. Go work on it, and next time, come and pronounce English words correctly and clearly so. Mm -hmm. 
Some of the struggles that I had about that statement was the lady was true. It was good that he said that to me instead of going somewhere and scanner about me. Um, but I also had these feelings to say she was insensitive. I'm black. I did second language, higher grade in English. Well, I got a B symbol for that matter in metric. So at least I can speak English a bit. So she was insensitive to say, this poor child, who's Suto, at least she's trying. He's trying. But I was deeply moved again that she was actually saying to me, please make sure that you work seriously on your message. It was hurtful, it was painful, but you know what? I had to deal with that kind of comment. My struggle was, you must remember that I come from an upbringing where it was indoctrinated. I never felt any discrimination in my life. I must, I must admit, I never, I think what my parents did was to make sure that they hide us from whatever was happening in the country. So I, I, I cannot say directly I was affected by apartheid or discrimination, or I, I can't say that. But my upbringing was like, you were taught that, for instance, when you look at a white person, he or she is superior. And that you are of no good. You are inferior. Um, you cannot bring any innovation whatsoever. These people are extremely good. And you can only excel if they are part of your success. You get what I mean? And so I go into this congregation with that whole baggage in me. And, and all of a sudden, it's like a single handsome guy like me. <laughs> uh, uh, after three months, now the church has got a secretary, a white lady. Oh my goodness, what's happening? I'm pinching myself. And a white lady, sweet woman, uh, would you love a cup of tea? I'm thinking, you, what's happening here? So you can imagine this, this new paradigm shift in my life of moving from this kind of era to this kind. And, and you go to a church council, this all male, white, members of the church ruling the council. And I'm thinking, my goodness, will I be able to excel in the skills and the gifting that God has given unto me. Oh, so you can imagine the struggles that I had at the time. And in, in, in my mind is, remember, you are black. You cannot do, you, do it. You, 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 you know good at all. And it's like, but you hear other voices saying, God loves you. God has given you an inner skill and talent and gifting. Excel in it. Identify it. Thrive in it. But I'm thinking the upbringing doesn't say that. My whole being, 30 years of my life is like, I regard these people as people who know it all. And I was indoctrinated in knowing that you cannot do anything without these people. So you can imagine the struggles that I, have at the, that I had at the time. And now all of a sudden, I have to lead this congregation, which is about 80% white and 20% black. 
So I wasn't even worried about the black people in that congregation. I am worried about pleasing the members of the congregations of the congregation who are white. So you can imagine. So it wasn't about sharing the gospel. It wasn't about bringing the true gospel of Jesus Christ. It was about me trying to impress the previous oppressors. It was me wanting to look good and make sure that I do not scare them, the remaining 39 members in the congregation, to go to any other church around Rodeport. So, for several months, I was fighting with this inner ghost. And poor white congregants, they were not even aware. I remember one Sunday I preached, and I didn't know as to what I was preaching about. After benediction, I sat there, I cried. Two people came, uh, Graham Emmett and a black guy, Sandil, they came and they said to me, sure, your message was powerful. I thought, I didn't understand what I was saying. I was struggling with the message. I didn't connect with these people. And now these people are becoming sarcastic. They are not being true to me. Now they come and tell me that my message was good. And they said to me, let me tell you, that's Graham Emmett. He says to me, Moachi, if there's anybody who's going to make sure that the ministry of Jesus is celebrated in this place is you. I can see that you're struggling in your English. I can see you're struggling with putting the message across. I can see that the blackness in you wants to speak English, uh, uh, sorry, wants to speak your, 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 your mother tongue. And I can see that you feel trapped you feel suffocated, but I want to reassure you, I'm not going anywhere. I am here, and I will walk with you every step of the way. But you must promise me one thing, that you're not going to give in and surrender to what you are experiencing now. In a, in a black setup, you must understand that we, we, we jump, we shout, we, we howl, we do all kinds of things. And, and the one other thing that uh, was worrying for me was how, how am I going to survive? I mean, I'm used to put a point across and you'll hear people exclaiming, hallelujah. Or oh, amen. And, and here I am, I mean, I'm looking at these people, they're kind of like looking at me as if, is this guy crazy? What is he talking about? I had to learn to adjust to the culture of the day, the culture of that community. And this is what I did. So I said, they told me they don't want to change me. So I'm going to push boundaries. So I said, I want to make sure that in this coming six months, I visit every member of the congregation in their homes. So I went. Every single home I visited. And then they unlocked the inner person in me the person with confidence and the person of recognizing that I am who I am. The true being that God created me and that I shouldn't even worry by looking at this community and seeing color and seeing age and seeing a different culture. But I must look at them as people who are here to worship with me 
for the benefit of the gospel. So here are the dynamics which were at play. So listen to this. And I'll make examples. What time is it, James? According to Acts. How many minutes left? Fifteen. Fifteen, good. So the dynamics were the following. One, subconsciously, I, was, I had a self-esteem, like I've said, because of my upbringing. And, and that low self-esteem constantly said to me, remember, you are inferior. And they are superior to you. And I, and I had an expectation of making sure that I prove to myself that I am more than what my mind is telling me what my background is telling me, what my upbringing is saying to me, what that inner voice is saying to me. I had to constantly make sure that I prove myself to be that capable, able preacher of the gospel. The other thing, I felt odd. I felt odd. And I want to just pinpoint this one. As, as I grew in that congregation, I, I had to then balance having to deal with blacks and white people in a congregation. So let me just make an example. And so we had a high tea, James. We had a high tea. It was in September. So we said, ah, any lady who wants to thrive and facilitate and lead this thing, you know, come forward. So a certain lady came, Celeste, Africans, speaking lady, and she organized the whole thing. And she then organized an African singer. So now the congregation is like black and white. So a black group of women came to me and said, okay, fine. Muruti, meaning minister, um, we, we, we worried. Things are not done here to include everybody. I said, okay, what do you mean? Well, Celeste, you look at the program, it's full of African-speaking singers and everything is in Africans. I said, okay, I understand, but uh, I've asked for volunteers. Last year, it was an English-speaking lady. Everything was in English. You're not English. Why did you complain? The year before last, it was a black person. There was an African singer here. They didn't complain. And so constantly you deal with having to satisfy this group because this group is saying, oh, he's becoming white. He's a snob. And you kind of like want to defend yourself to say, I'm not a snob, remember? And you're trying to say to these, to these white people, please, I'm not wanting to change this church to become black. You must understand, I'm trying to hold the balance. And so you can imagine the things that I went through and constantly challenging my faith. And it reminded me that, you know what, this God that we worship, this God that we think, for most of us, is a patriarchal, patriarchal God. He is not. This God that we think that we can remote control and, 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 and picture him as somebody who is, I'm going to be very controversial, female or male or young or old. It's not like that. God's God is beyond our human comprehension. We cannot box him. And so I had to constantly remind myself to say, I am here not to satisfy white people. I am here not to satisfy the interests of the blacks, but I'm here to satisfy the interests of the gospel. I am here to say God is calling us to be a community, a community that is loving, a, co a community that is tolerant of our differences, of our cultures, of our tradition. We worship this God who is like a rainbow. 
a God that when you think that he is orange, no ways, he's not orange, he's actually green. A God, when you go to the mall and come back and think, oh, he is green. Oh, by the way, he has turned black. A God, when you think that he is worshipped like this, he turned us to be liars. And so that is the God that has shaped my faith, the God that has shaped my ministry, the God that has made me to survive Willow Park Methodist Church. And I always say to them, you stuck with me. <laughs> Whether you like it or not, you stuck with me. And I remember at some point I said to them, can somebody just write on a piece of paper and ask me to preach on some topic that is sensitive? Voila. You know what they, uh, uh, they came up with? Ancestors. <laughs> How I wish I could share with you that, but I can't. So that says to you, you can just ask your minister to invite me to come and preach at some point for a lovely service, isn't it, James? Thank you. So, having constantly want to prove myself, Ne? Because I was young, unmarried, and black. God enveloped me. And God constantly said to me, You are my son whom I dearly love. Do not care what's happening. Imagine racist comments and stuff in the media and you are black and uh, so usually when there are uh, news like that in the media the first thing that i need to say before i preach is to comment of whatever has, has, has been happening in the media and so i'm thinking what's that lady sparrow what the, the first name Pe penny so you can imagine, James. So I'm used to, oh, by the way, in the newspapers from uh, uh, Monday to yesterday on Saturday, uh, dominating news is this. So now it's Penny and the rest of the other people. And I'm thinking, yo, the blacks are going to watch how I interpret the whole thing. The whites are going to also kind of like, hmm, when I hear what the minister is going to say, can I tell you what I said? No. <laughs> All that I said was, we are, or we were crafted and created from the same pot. We, like a stew, with many ingredients. All that needs to happen is to make sure that when the other hates the other, that we do not prolong that into becoming ugly, but we create a space where we converse around the issue, we challenge it head on and understand where people come from, where people have failed to build, we must tell them. Where people have wronged others, we must tell them and move forward in building this country of ours. In conclusion, one lady said to me, which I want us maybe to converse around it. One lady said to me, oh, this Methodist Church of Southern Africa uh, with this thing of cross-cultural ministry, aren't they pushing this BEE -E thing? <laughs> My goodness. So to have a sense of humor like me, it helps. Because you don't get irritated by such stuff. Because that lady was actually saying to me, you are a product of BEE -E done in the church. And so you are from a disadvantaged communities, disadvantaged 
background and so the church is wanting to move you from township country ministry into suburban ministry in other words he she was saying the church is actually elevating your economic status and so you like it or not Moahi, you are a product of bee in the church what do you say but you know what the Bible says it is when we are weak that God becomes stronger and makes us stronger. The challenges of life, all the prejudices, the discrimination, the elephants in the room that rules us and tosses us from pillar to post, we need to tackle them and make sure that we don't leave any stone unturned that we attend to it, but we can only do that as we follow the example of Jesus, as we follow his teachings and his examples. And I want to say to you, as you go through Lent, remember that the devil, every time when we intensify our relationship with God, he becomes even more creative and tries other avenues to win us back to him. So it is your choice. What do you do with the elephant in the room, especially in whatever has been happening now recently? Amen. Is there any questions or any comments? They made good boss sticky forest. <laughs> <laughs> Any comments, questions, David? Maraki, would you please repeat when you when when the question's been asked, would you please repeat it for the camera? Okay, repeat the question. Okay. You mentioned something on the Zulu side, other side. I didn't understand that much in Afrikaans. <laughs> what happens to you or were you in Oh, okay. And, uh, what happened there? So you you said I I I dealt with the Afri uh, the I dealt with the Kosas and the Zulu culture and I didn't. Yeah, you didn't end up with that. You mentioned something about Africans. So the the Africans people in North Kasach were very welcoming. The the only uh, 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 hiccup that I met there in 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 an Africans community was that every time when somebody dies at home, they call you. Doesn't matter what time of the evening or morning. They call you and they don't even ask the undertakers to come. Um, so they ask you to come and close the eyes of the deceased and they give you a, um, a wet cloth and then wipe the face and then you do some prayers. That's the only irritation that I had with them. But otherwise they were a very welcoming community. They didn't have all sorts of... In fact, what was surprising with them that it was... Every time when I wanted to speak Africans in my sermon, I kind of like, why do you speak Africans? Go to English, man. Most of us here, we don't know Africans. I'm thinking, you are in what I mean, and, and then I discovered that it was the grandchildren of the African speaking community. And so most of the uh, youngsters, they didn't know Africans, so they preferred English. So it was very welcoming. So, and, and, and their dealings with, with, with me were more black than Africans. So it was kind of a comfort zone for me. I grew up in a family of respecting elder people, white, black, or whatever, and especially in our Lord. I'm a Shangana. Oh. We Zulus culture, as it is. We respect other people. There are some certain things which we cannot say up to a certain stage of age. But uh, to find that since well, when now everything is getting changed, like in the congregation, everywhere we walk, I find that we as blacks or these young generations, but not you, right, they are like. My belief is that, you know, when I will just show, you know, let's assume this is the way. Yeah. Our belief is that, you know, you give the right of the weapon. Exactly. Our belief.
believe is that you know you give the other person to, to sit, sit and you stand yeah the place is full it's full maybe you may not have seen yeah but uh, you find such things up to now even in the congregation not only here in the forest it's not happening how do you deal about this type of thing stereotypes that is especially on the black side well it, it depends firstly i i i i study how the congregation respect tradition and culture and i analyze how the interact the interaction between the kids and the elderly for instance there was a situation where uh, in, in one of the churches in soweto it was a big service and um, uh, uh, there were youngsters on the seats and stuff they had a corner there and then one of the stewards came to ask them to stand so that the elderly can come in and sit. So I watched it. And then later in the year, it happened again. So I halted the whole service and I said to the steward, eh, 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 Gilders, you don't go anywhere. You sit where you sit it. And I had to deal with the late coming of elderly people to say, you cannot expect a, a, a youth to come early into the church, respect worship service, and then you come later, 30, 45 minutes late, and then you disrupt. So if you want, so that's how radical I am. That's why James was saying to me, every time when I raise my hand, my hand at Sino, she goes, oh, I hope he's going to. So, so I had to deal with it because we were, not we, we were, we are brewing an angry young generation, a generation where they feel like tradition and culture is putting more pressure onto them and that they wanna leave your mainland churches and go to your more relaxed charismatic churches because of all these things that we do to them and not make them feel at home and be themselves in a situation like that. I hope I've answered you. Can I just ask one question? Uh, you mentioned something about the Methodist Church, <laughs> and uh, of which, in the Methodist Church, still a big question to me. And uh, we once had a meeting of calling the different congregation, I mean, white and black, together, of which I think we were together with you, and, I, and you raised such a question. And uh, it comes to a point of, why do we really divide one another instead of being in one? Then the, one of the elderly persons stood up and he mentioned the same thing as what you are saying that you know, he was from Eastern Cape, but I don't see him anymore. Like, you know, why do I stand in front of the congregation without wearing those Manyano uniforms and uh, everything? Hmm. I don't know, such things. How do you deal about them? With them? How do I deal with people who wearing that uniform, uh -huh. you know, not wearing a uniform, coming in a congregation and uh, wearing the shorts and they say it's not respect. You, you see, it was good for me to, to, to experience the country ministry and suburban ministry. And, and I mean, you can see my age. I hope I look like, young. Um, that I, I always teach people as to um, why historically in, in, in your township churches people wear jackets and and hats and or ties in the NK I know that they kinda like, you know, you should wear you, you kinda like teach them to interpret scripture correctly. You know? And I always make sure that I also become sensitive because there are areas in the setup of the Methodist uh, Church of Southern Africa, areas where you cannot bring in uh, 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 cultures like a man wearing just a shirt to go to church. In those situations, I just oblige. Oblige. I, I, I don't. I don't. I don't. I respect whatever tradition they, you know. But I will always say to them, "But you must remember where I come from. You must al always remember that this is the teaching. This is what needs to happen." But I will also say to them, "But I respect how you do church here, so I'll wear that."
How do how many members? At, at Wilro? 165 families. I don't know the numbers. Okay. They were worried at some point because there was a time when where, where the church wanted me to get married. I mean, I, I got married very late, after 35 years of age. Because I thought, hey, this marriage thing, I think it's a prison, man. Hey. I love managing my time and going everywhere I want, you know. And by the way, I was, I was the connectional coordinator of the youth in the church, you know, I was responsible for all the youth in the six countries of Southern Africa. So I enjoyed it. And I, and I mean, I mean, your Paul Verain and all these elder women when are you getting married? You know, those are some of the things that were irritating to me, you know, to say, but you can't deal with this because you're not married. And I'm thinking, hello, you know, I can in fact be a better marriage counselor than somebody who's married. It doesn't mean, you know, you have to get married to know the stuff. I mean, so there was a constant struggle, you know. So I had to, uh, but when I finally met my wife, I kind of like, oh, I surrender it all. So then I got married and yeah. Did I answer you? Oh, yes. So I got carried away. Oh, I got carried away about. So they, they were worried at first because they thought it was a rough uh, path that I'm taking and they were worried about my, by my well-being and my uh, maintenance and sustenance of life, whether I'll be able to thrive in the ministry. And um, so now they're fine. I mean, I think my personality helped me a lot in, in, in dealing with my faith in the Methodist Church of, I mean, I'm a bubbly person. I'm a shy person, but I'm very bubbly. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Well, see, I think sometimes now, it is, it's a painful time in race relations in many ways, and we don't know how to talk about it, um, I think. Um, I, I have the privilege of teaching it with students, and I teach history, so you have to talk about it, but I know in terms of adult relations, I think often we just shut up rather than really talk. Have you have you been able to work through issues in your congregation so people don't just sit next to each other but actually really get to know each other and hear about the hurts and the fears and the whatever that we experience? Okay, yeah, we did, but there's a, there's a struggle there. They, you know, you, you, you set up uh, some anti-bias kind of sessions where, you know, they kind of like talk to each other. But both groups, I must say, at Willow Park, were not genuine with each other. I think they're kind of like covering up and wanting to be okay with each other. Because I said to them, can you please share your frustration of each other? What you don't like about each other? What irritates about the other about you, that kind of stuff so that we know and make sure, okay, fine, this is how you, know, you want to be respected and you want to be dealt with, you know, that kind of stuff. And so they, got, ah. they then chatted with other nice things, like your chick flicks kind of thing, you know. They didn't actually dealt with the matter. I mean, when I go to, uh, uh, not as an illicit Florida, uh, Valley Florida Methodist Church, so first service, Christmas, nice, went into the hall for a cup of tea and cake. And so this, I'm a new minister, by the way, so would you like a cup of tea? I said, yes, can you please, uh, I need a racist one, uh, a white rainbow. Kind of like, they were kind of like, because I mentioned, that's how I introduced myself, I need a racist tea, man, a white rainbow. They kind of like shrinked. And, it was like, you know, because I'm, I'm wanting to say to them, can we just be free about the stuff? Because if we don't become friendly about the stuff and, and, and deal with them, we won't get to the bottom of it, you know? So it's a journey. I, I'm not even there yet. I'm not even halfway there. I might be at the introductory part, but I'm not there as yet. 
you satisfied? James. <laughs> uh, I, I think what is important, Mark, and what you have shared is, is the fact that, um, and when I introduced on Sunday, it, it, it's something that we haven't really spoken about. The change has come, and it's something we don't want to speak about because we are the too sensitive or we too insensitive. Mm. But the reality is when we see what's happening around us, the reality is it's something that we have to address. Yeah. And it starts with what am I doing and what, uh, what can we be doing together. And I think that that is very, very important. And I think what you mentioned um, that picked up is that if you start an agenda, I think that's wrong. Mm, mm. It has to be a relational and what you're end up mm. saying genuine. Mm. If we are going to follow a program, it's doomed to fail. Yeah. It's about being real, speaking when I'm hurt, um, and addressing issues as you have shared. And thank you so much for what you have shared. I think maybe maybe before you, I must say just for two minutes, I must say if you think racism is bad, try tribalism. Ethnicity is is bad and I'm not talking about tribalism somewhere in 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 Kilani Mall or something no 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 no. I'm talking about tribalism ethnicity in the Methodist Church of Southern Africa it's extremely bad extremely I'm I'm a, I'm a, I'm a free person I'm you know, my struggle is when you see I, I always want to make sure that people connect and stuff you know James is my witness. If I'm with Tabo and we, we're chatting, there's a conversation, and James come to join us, the tendency with ministers is number one, they don't change the language. They continue with either Kosa, Soto, Tswana, or Zulu. And I always find myself having to Responding in English in making sure that this one, you know what, this one cannot hear. This one is interested in having a conversation with us. So can you please change the language? He doesn't. Okay, let's leave James. Kosa, guy speaking Kosa, so I know Kosa, I know Zulu. Conversation happens. Etswana comes, who doesn't understand Kosa or Zulu, comes. I switch to English to make sure that the three of us understand each other, that one won't even change the language. We'll continue with Kosa. So the problem here is not racism alone. It is multifaceted. Fa Faceted. Faceted. Oh, English. <laughs> oh, you struggle. I'm good. I'm good there. So it, it is multifaceted. <laughs> Yeah, so, so don't feel bad about it because every one of us, every one of us is to be blamed. If this country is going in, is chaotic and it's not coming into terms in terms of our relationship with each other, all of us bear the blame for no relationship and non-friendship. So it must start with us making sure that we build bridges and we build and create paths and meet each other halfway. Amen.